And verse 7, don't be wise in your own eyes. This is a word that's quoted also in Romans 12, 16. It's a New Testament exhortation, really. Don't become wise in your own eyes. That means don't think that you have wisdom. You see, this is the trouble with uh, so many people. The exhortation is another translation as it is. Don't think of yourself as wise. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God. And we should be the first to jump up and say, Lord, that, that's me. That's me, Lord. I like it. And if we have that attitude always, then we can get wisdom. But if I sometimes think of myself as wise, and I'll tell you where we are in danger of that. We are in danger of that when we see another brother or sister doing something foolishly. And then, when we begin to judge them, we have become wise in our own eyes. I would not do that. He does it, but I would not do it. What have I become? I have become wise in my own eyes compared to that brother. And then I've become a spiritual idiot according to 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Those who compare themselves with others are spiritual idiots. Brothers and sisters, don't become a spiritual idiot by comparing yourself with other people. Always humble yourself. There was a man called Socrates who lived... Um, years before Christ and he, he had a reputation as one of the wisest men in Greece and somebody asked him what was the difference between him and other people and he said the difference is this all of us know nothing they know nothing and I know nothing the only difference is that I know that I know nothing and the, all the others they don't know that that's the only difference and if I am a little wiser than the others the reason is that I know that I know nothing and those people are so stupid, they don't even know that. And we can, take some, we can learn a lesson from Socrates for the church. That the wise man is the man who recognizes that he really knows nothing. Compared to the ocean of God's wisdom. He's got a little few drops inside his cup. And he thinks that he's wise. He says, don't be wise in your own eyes. No, and that's such a terrific danger. It's a hindrance. Don't think of yourself as wise, but concentrate on... The fear of the Lord and on turning away from evil. Let that be your aim. Not to find out how wise you are compared to other brothers. But to, do I fear the Lord more? Am I turning away from evil? Yeah, then you're all right. And if you do that, it says you'll even get healing in your body. It'll be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Not only will you get wisdom in your life, but the fear of the Lord brings health in our body. That's a good verse for physical healing. Fear the Lord. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Humble yourself. Humility and the fear of the Lord can bring healing in your body and refreshment to your bones that are diseased. Wonderful. And then it speaks about our attitude to mammon. See, that's a big area where we need to acquire wisdom. Our attitude to material wealth. And the first thing that Solomon says in the book of Proverbs concerning material wealth is honor the Lord from your wealth. Or in other words, glorify God with your money. Can you take that exhortation? Glorify God with your money. With that expenditure. Can you say, I'm spending this for the glory of God. And that will give us a quick answer concerning whether we should spend our money in certain ways. Glorify God with your money. And use all of your money to glorify God. Honor Him. And from the first of all your produce. That means give Him the first part of all your income. I noticed one thing today in Genesis chapter 4 as I was looking there. In the offerings that Cain and Abel brought, we know that God accepted Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's offering. And there's one significant thing mentioned there about the two offerings, which indicated the type of heart attitude that Abel and Cain had. It says about Cain, the only thing that the Holy Spirit records about Cain's offering, is that Cain brought 
an offering of the fruit of the ground. It wasn't the best, it wasn't the first, but it was an offering. But when Abel brought an offering, he brought the first of his flock and of their fat portions, which means the very best. And the Lord had regard for Abel because he brought the best. And the Lord sees the heart attitude when we bring an offering to him. Even today in the church, people can bring an offering like Cain. They can put money in the box. They can bring an offering of something to God. But it's not their best. It's not that which has cost them something. There are people who serve God today. But it's not their best. We must never bring to the Lord an offering like Cain. Just a casual offering. Everything we offer to God must be the very best. That's the meaning here. That's the example we learned from Abel. He gave the best. And God accepted it. Because his heart attitude indicated God deserves the very best in my life. Cain's attitude, well, yeah, I have to give something to God, okay, and I'll give something. And there are these two attitudes you find even among believers. Those who say, God deserves the very best of my life. He deserves the best of my children. He deserves the best time of my life. All of my energy, all of my time, he deserves the best. And there are others who, as a token, give something to God. And there you can think of Cain and Abel. And it says, honor the Lord from your wealth. From what God has given you. Honor him. And from the first of all your produce. You remember Jesus said in Luke 12 verse 21. About the rich man. Who wanted to build up his barns. Because he had so much. And God said to him you fool. You're going to die tonight. And then Jesus said so will it be with everyone who is not. You know the phrase he used. In Luke 12 21. Rich. Towards God. To be rich towards God. It's a wonderful phrase Jesus used there. To be rich towards God. And we can ask ourselves this question. Am I rich towards God? Then I'm really a rich man. Am I not rich towards God? Then even if I'm a millionaire, I'm a poverty stricken beggar in God's eyes. Be rich towards God. That's the exhortation of Solomon here, we get wisdom through being faithful in the use of money. Through honoring God with the material things with which he has blessed us, we grow in wisdom. And that's why mammon becomes a means by which God tests us to see whether he can give us the true riches. And the true riches are wisdom. That's the true riches. But he's got to first see what, what's my attitude to this false riches called money. And if I love it so much and I'm occupied with that and I give a token offering to God from that but my whole life is occupied with that, God will see that he cannot give me the true riches. We come to that. It comes down later in the same chapter. But first of all, he says that if you do this, God will not be in debt to you. He will prosper you. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things you need in life will be added to you but God having tested you with prosperity and verse 10 is a picture of prosperity your barns overflowing and your vats overflowing with new wine then he will test you with adversity first with prosperity and then with adversity means trial and difficulty and that's what's spoken of in the next verse my son do not reject the discipline or the chastening of the Lord or loath his reproof because it is through the trial and chastening and adversity that follows the prosperity after he's taught you how to abound and then he makes you suffer need he's going to teach you wisdom for whom the Lord loves he reproves even as the father the son in whom he delights if you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 you see that this uh, part of scripture is quoted in Hebrews 12 and it's very interesting to see the place where it is quoted Hebrews 12 5 you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons my son and that exhortation my son the Holy Spirit takes here is an 
as God speaking to us, not as children, not as babies, but as mature sons. My son, that is from Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And verse 7, God deals with you as with sons. And it is in the context, verse 1, 2, 3 and 4, of following Jesus who resisted sin to the point of death and who endured the cross. Giving the example of Jesus, he quotes this verse in Proverbs and says, when the Lord takes you through trial and chastening, don't get discouraged, don't get offended when God rebukes you, when he corrects you. Don't loathe his reproof. When God rebukes you, maybe not directly, but through an elder brother, don't loathe it. God doesn't always come to us directly, remember? You remember the story of the man who wanted to collect the rent from the vineyard. He didn't come himself. He sent his servants to collect the rent. If he had come himself, they may have respected him. But when he sent his servants, they despised his servants. And the man said, if they despise my servants, they despise me. How do we know whether we get offended with God's reproof? When God reproves us through some servant of his and we get offended, that proves that we loathe God's correction. We hate God's correction. We love his prosperity in verse 10. Oh yeah, we'd like our barns to be filled with plenty. And we'd like our vats to overflow, our bank accounts to overflow. That's the, we don't have vats today, but bank accounts. Our bank accounts overflowing, we'd love that. But what about his reproof? We can be cakes cooked on one side, fried pancakes fried on one side, not turned over. One side all uncooked. God cooks us on one side with prosperity and then turns us over and cooks us on the other side with adversity and reproof and correction. And then we are fully developed. Otherwise only half our body is developing, the other half is not growing properly. So we see the balance here in Proverbs. Whom the Lord loves, he reproves because his aim is to give us wisdom. His aim is to give us wisdom. And so it says here, in the Good News Bible it says, pay close attention when he reproves you. That means when God rebukes you, corrects you, maybe directly or through some servant, listen carefully. And you listen carefully and pay close attention, you can become wise. You get offended. You remain without wisdom. So wisdom comes through chastening. And then Solomon goes on to say, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom. That is the man who has submitted to the reproofs of God. Humbled himself under the discipline of the Lord. How blessed is that man who finds wisdom. And the man who gains understanding. And the word here means to draw out understanding. That is like lowering a bucket into a deep well and drawing out that water. It doesn't come by just opening a tap. Drawing out that understanding and that well is in the scriptures. To go into it, to dig into it, to meditate on it and to draw out that spiritual understanding. How blessed is that man? Brothers and sisters, let me say one thing. Let no Bible study sessions deprive us of going to the well ourselves. We would be like to be like big Maharajas sitting with our legs crossed outside the well and somebody else draws the water out from the bucket and gives it to us. Yeah, but we miss something if it's always like that. We miss something if we don't know how to draw out that from the well ourselves. That's a very healthy spiritual exercise to go into the word of God and to draw out that understanding. How blessed is that man who finds wisdom, who has drawn out this understanding. And here, I was telling you what the true riches are. We spoke earlier about the false riches. That is the wealth of this world. And here it says the true riches. The profit of wisdom is better than the profit of silver. And it's gain than fine gold. What is that? What that means is people keep gold and silver in their homes. You know why they keep gold and silver in their homes? Because they feel the value of gold will keep going up. 
And if I store up gold and silver in my house, ten years from now, I spend only a thousand rupees to start with, but now it has become five thousand rupees. The value of the same bit of gold. And they feel very happy when the price of gold and silver goes up in the market. And here it says, that's all nothing compared to the profit and gains 